Hi, welcome to the first episode of Fill Your Boots with FIL. I'm Colin May, and today we're here with Natasha McGuire from Farm Medics. Natasha, welcome, and Thank you. great to have you here. Can you start by telling us how you became known as the mastitis lady, and how did that journey start to <laughs> that point? Yeah, it was back in the day, um, we were doing some work on farms, actually nothing related to mastitis at all, and they started saying to us, you know, what do you know about mastitis? And we'd say, well, not much. We know milk comes out of a cow, that's about it. And um, they were saying they had problems with um, treatment failures and the, the antibiotics didn't seem to be clearing up mastitis. So we decided, just out of interest, to do some testing to see what was going on, and it was a, a pathogen actually that doesn't respond very well to antibiotics, so uh, that was where, where it began. And then, you know, farmers would hear of about it and ring up and say, oh, are you that mastitis lady? And that's where that came from. You certainly started to develop quite a reputation and, and you know, I've been very lucky to do some work with you over the last few years. You know, prior to working with you, I, I had no idea what CNS was. If you'd asked me you know, how much E. coli mastitis we got in New Zealand, we, we thought it was a rare pathogen. You know, your testing in there, what, what have you learnt from the testing you've done and, and the pathogen profiles within New Zealand? It's been really interesting. I think, um, you know, it was always thought when we first started that, um, for example, there was no Staph aureus in New Zealand as well, that it wasn't an issue in New Zealand. And what we realised is actually that very little testing was being done. And it wasn't because people didn't want to do testing, it was because it wasn't really widely available. Um, the remote nature of farms meant that it just simply wasn't feasible to get samples in, and if they took them to vets, then often vets didn't culture in those days as well. So we're only going back, you know, just three or four years ago. Um, most vets would then send the samples in, and so farmers weren't getting results back for two weeks, and this is where the problem started. So testing just really wasn't um, a viable option. You know, why, why should farmers know what the pathogens are? Um, that, that's a really good question. So aside from testing, I think initially um, the, the, the focus for testing was just a, with regards to treatment of, um, of the pathogen to know if an antibiotic would work. But what we very quickly realised is it goes beyond that. Um, knowing the pathogen is, is really um, a crucial piece of um, the puzzle, if you like, for a farmer's mastitis picture, just to know what the path is for that cow and also where the origin of that infection came from. So it's not just about that cow anymore. The cow in front of you has mastitis. She needs uh, you know, a pathway with her, whether it's with a drug, with, without a drug, um, what the probability of a cure is, but really importantly is how to prevent other herd mates from becoming infected with the same pathogen. Because often these things run in, in a pattern. So there's a pattern of things that, that have happened that lead to this infection, and there are going to be other cases the same because of something that we're doing you know, a systematic failure. So without identifying that pathogen, we really have no idea what we're dealing with and how to stop um, new cases. So, so give me some examples around that. Like you've got, let's walk through this pathogen. Everybody knows about strep uberus. Strep uberus, yeah, we all know about that. And, and I think what's happened within New Zealand is, you know, I've changed. We used to talk about mastitis and I say to farmers now, look, let, let's, Let's break this down and let's start talking about the pathogen. So tell me a bit more about the pathogen. You've got strep uberus. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about it. Where's the source? Where does it come from? I'm pleased you picked strep uberus because I think most people would probably still say it's the most common pathogen in New Zealand dairy herds today, and it's not. Like you talked about CNS before, that's the most common one. But what's really interesting is you know, strep uberus is um, probably picked up mostly because a lot of the cases are very clinical, so they're very obvious. Um, and a cow will have, you know, quite bad mastitis and people will think, oh, that's bad. And, and then, you know, often that's tested and it's strep uberus. So um, strep uberus comes from the cow's own environment. It's from the gut. It's from um, manure, dirt, mud. So anywhere, uh, like one of the Aussie vets said to me once, mud and mingling, that's, that's pretty much strep uberus. It's like a dirty teenager with a dirty bedroom. Um, it's just environmental from, you know, manure, dirt, mud. And then you move to CNS. I'd never heard of it until four years ago, and there's a lot of farmers in New Zealand haven't heard of it, but you've just said that's the most prominent pathogen we're dealing with. It is, and I think worldwide it's the same. It's responsible for around 54% of mastitis in New Zealand, and that's not my statistics, that's according to DairyNZ. So that if you think of 54% of the cows with a pathogen CNS, 
I think one of the biggest things about CNS is it's avoidable. It's a nuisance kind of organism. It's like a whole bunch of kids with a snotty nose. Yeah, and that's easily treated? Or? Um, actually, the latest research would indicate that CNS is um, something that is not necessarily requiring treatment, but of course that would be you know up to the vet to discuss with the farmer. So the, the, this CNS will, will definitely elevate cell counts. That'll have an impact. Definitely. On... Yep, it elevates the bulk tank cell count, and it's seldom involved in clinical cases of mastitis, even though 54% of the cases of mastitis in New Zealand uh, were CNS. If we look yep. at Dairy and Z stat, that means clinical. Um, a lot of the time there's going to be subclinical CNS and that, that really pushes cell counts up, but often it's not clinical. So that gives you a wider view that like there's a really a lot of CNS involved in herbs. One that, one that I used to say to farmers regularly was we just don't get E. coli in New Zealand. I now know that's not correct, but one of the funniest things I remember was being with you at a field day in the Manawa two, and you telling a farmer that, yeah, the E. coli has quite a high prevalence in New Zealand, and the guy threw his arms in the air and said, no, that, well, that'll just kill the cows. Mm -hmm. Not true. No, not true. Um, e. coli is actually responsible for a lot of moderate cases of mastitis that clear up by themselves. So, you know, one minute the cow's got something, the next minute she hasn't because she's knocked it on the head. Unfortunately, with E. coli, and, and I guess there's a whole family of of bacteria involved with the classification E. coli, some of them make a toxin, and it's actually the toxin that makes the cow very sick. So what often happens is the cow's immune response will be strong. Um, it'll kill the bacteria, but the, the endotoxin in the bacterial cell wall actually is what almost kills the cow, makes the cow very, very sick. So that doesn't happen with all cases of E. coli. Most of them you wouldn't even know that it was E. coli. Right. And, and, and we're seeing more E. coli, e. coli in New Zealand. Look, look, we're getting more barns, feed pads, is that increasing the prevalence? Um, certainly, I think intensification um, elevates the risk of, of E. coli mastitis. I think also that we're just doing more testing, to be frank. So a lot of the time it was just assumed it was just mastitis and um, nobody was really testing. Now that there's more testing being done, we know there's a lot more prevalence of E. coli. So what was assumed in the spring, I mean, there used to be posters on the walls at farms that would say, it's spring, it's going to be strep uberus, use this drug. I mean, that's just so oversimplified. Yeah. It's really not funny. But the focus coming on, on drug use has meant that testing is becoming more normalised and, and now that we are testing more, we're seeing a lot more of it. Yeah, and look, I, I can go back, I think it was the 2018 spring, we had an exceptionally wet spring in New Zealand and we had a lot of milk quality problems coming from E. coli. That will, will affect the bulk tank. Yes, it can. Yeah. Um, as I say, the, these symptoms are not always um, the ones you think of. So when a cow is severely ill, often you know, an investigation is done as, as to what that cow had. Um, and so that's where that reputation that E. coli kills cows came from is because some of those cases were E. coli and they were so severe that yeah. they sort of etch in your memory. But the reality is that a lot of the E. coli is not like that at all and, um, yeah, certainly not, not severe. And the one we don't want, Staph aureus, mm -hmm. the bogey in the room. <clears throat> yeah. The, but there's hardly any in New Zealand. True or false? <laughs> false. And I think worldwide it's a problem. Look, um, I think it's something we've got to watch, uh, particularly Fonterra's just announced that the payout's going up for them, so that encourages people to keep cows. And And I know that, you know, um, some of the traditional methods for trying to find high cell count cows, that sort of thing, and assuming they have staph is, is not always right. So we have to be very vigilant around staph aureus because as we sort of want to sell more milk and hold on to perhaps carryovers and and you know, uh, cows that we know we probably should be getting rid of, um, that's where bugs like that have a real opportunity. Um, but it's not, yeah, it's, it's spread cow to cow, so it's a huge concern. Um, every milking, let's face it, in, in most New Zealand sheds, at least 10 cows, at least 10. Some sheds, it's more like 20 a day are sharing a set of cows. So the risk for spread is, is there. So that is, the, that is the main pathogen that will go cow to cows, transmittable. That's yeah, there are others, um, but in New Zealand we don't see so much of the other ones. So, of course, M. bovis, which um, we'll exclude from this discussion because obviously it's really contagious um, by comparison, but um, Staph aureus strep ag agalactae is also another pathogen, but we don't see it in New Zealand because, um, you know, we, we see that more in developing countries where maybe the standards of hygiene amongst people are not, not as good. So those pathogens come from people. Like Staph, does that originate from people too? 
Um, I guess we'll never really know, but I think originally, yes, it, it does. And we do have evidence that, um, you know, things go from people to cows. So, for example, um, Staph aureus lives in the nose and on the skin of about 30% of people. Now, if we're milking without gloves, if we're in the shed with a drippy nose at 4 a.m., which, let's face it, yep. <laughs> that happens, um, we know that just from a nose wipe on a hand and touching the cow, you provide an opportunity to inoculate that cow. It doesn't mean you know, that, that that will inoculate the cow, but the opportunity is definitely there. And if we think back in time, um, issue with smallpox, for example, smallpox never affected people that milk cows because often the people were um, actually infected with cowpox and they had an immunity to the smallpox. Now, the cowpox came from the cow to the people, so it's a two-way street. Every time we're interacting with another living organism, we've got an opportunity to spread disease. There's a couple of other things. We, we dealt with a, a client of ours before Christmas with a prototheca outbreak. Mm -hmm. Not That was not a nice situation. Mm -hmm. Prototheca, where does that come from? Uh, yeah, I know it's rare yeah. it's, and you don't it's, want it's, it. It's really rare and I, I, I don't want to create anxiety out there, but like these things are all, I guess, environmental. They're around us. They're kind of everywhere. And you've got to remember that a, a milking shed is not like an operating theatre. So prototheca is actually an algae. It's not a bacteria at all. Um, and where it comes from is anywhere that there's kind of, you know, green uh, slime, basically. So it can come from standing water. It can come from, you know, a lot of farms in New Zealand are still using for their water source um you know, natural water sources like dams or creeks, river water that's not chlorinated. So that's an opportunity for that algae to be present. Um, how it gets into the cow, that's a, a different situation. So taking care around intramammary preparations, that we're not pushing something into a cow's teat when we're administering a treatment or a dry cow teat seal, that sort of thing is really important. And prototheca can just be around, even just from hosing cows off. Right now it's, it's hot. So we're sprinkling cows in the yard. If we're doing that with water that's not treated, then we have that opportunity for sure. Yeah, yeah. and that's quite a deal. That cannot be treated, can it? That's no, it can't be treated. And once a cow's got it, then um, cow to cow, there's a risk. So just like Staph aureus with that sharing yeah. the cluster between the cows, we've got a risk of transmitting it to other animals in the herd. Yeah. And the other one that I think we should touch on too is serratia that mm -hmm. we've seen a little bit of. We don't see it very often, but again, can be devastating to get that in a herd. Serratia? Yeah, definitely. So that tends to run more. I'm not sure that it's transmitted cow to cow, but of course any mastitis probably is able to, to be transmitted that way. Um, that tends to be around, once again, standing water. So anywhere that's slimy. Um, for example, it might be <laughs> interesting to know that in your own shower at home, um, you probably have serratia growing. So sometimes if the shower's not cleaned, and I'm sure there's plenty of people that have lived in a flat before and can relate, you get that orange slime in a shower, that is serratia. Now, serratia comes from the gut, so it doesn't come from your skin. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So without being too graphic, you know, it, it's once I'm just having visions <laughs> of my daughter at Victoria University <laughs> going flatting for the first time. I might have a conversation with it. <laughs> That's it. So, yeah, definitely don't be going milking the cows. But where you see that orange slime, so milking sheds, there's a lot of opportunity for that because, let's face it, like the cows come in, there's a hell of a mess once they, you know, we're always hosing down, things are wet. And this is the opportunity for serratia um, to exist. And, and same if you've got a, like a leaking water line or a broken pipe or, you know, um, you're irrig irrigating too short between rounds. Those sort of things can really contribute to bugs like serratia. Cool. So, so this is great. How do farmers know what they're dealing with? Well, they don't. That's the big problem, isn't it? So uh, from our side, um, testing is really your best bet. So we developed checkup um, back in whenever it was, 2014. Um, to look at something that farmers could have cow side so that they could actually see. Because, like I said before, the problem with um, even going off farm to get testing means someone has to go into town, get cleaned up and, you know, take it somewhere. And, and then you, the time delay between getting the results back was just too long. So for us, we realised it was really important that the farmer had control of um, being able to do that, whether it was a Friday night that they had mastitis or a Christmas day or whatever it was, that they had the ability to, um, to do that if they wanted to. So they can do their, their own individual testing of cows. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen a lot of testing. Typically, they've taken those samples, they've taken them to a vet. Why do they get no results so often? That's something that comes back quite often, quite frustrating. You take a sample, goes away, three or four days later, comes back, no result. Okay, there's a couple of possibilities there. One is that nothing grew. Um, so that can often happen uh, when we talked about E. coli before, sort of hit and run organism where it's there and it's gone. 
Uh, can also happen sometimes with CNS where the cows actually got on top of it. So if nothing grew, it could be one of those things. Um, if we get a lot of no growth, though, we'd be a little bit concerned about that, why that was happening. And then, of course, we've got a monitoring program in place for MBOVIS in New Zealand. We're lucky. Um, that would be one of the considerations. But if it's a no result because the sample's contaminated, is that what you were meaning? Yeah. Could it be contaminated? Yeah. Taking that sample is important, is it? Taking the sample, I mean, the reality is it doesn't matter if the vet's testing the sample or the farmer's testing the sample. The farmer's taking the sample. So I think what's of concern there is we need, um, of course, the teat to be cleaned. So that would be cleaned with maybe teat spray first, alcohol wipe, and then the four milk stripped before the sample is taken. Why that's important is in the street canal of the teat, there's a lot of just things that'll be in there, bacteria that are not actually a feature of what's in the udder. So we want to make sure what we're seeing is actually from inside the cow, from the udder, not from the outside of the teat or the dirty hand or, or whatever. And um, if we can get a nice clean sample and test it on site, we've got an advantage because, like I said, we didn't take the sample in an operating theatre. This is taken in a cow shed. So anything yeah. that's in the background, the trouble with taking a sample and sending it somewhere is that background noise. Um, milk is such a supportive nutrient it'll grow those bacteria in the background to the point where um, you can't really see what was there in the first place. There'll just be so much other stuff. And that's really disappointing because the farmer goes to the effort to take the sample, gets no result back, then he's none the wiser, you know, like what was that about? It just cost me $30 or whatever at the vets and, and, and or the lab that I sent it to and, and I've got nothing. So then it sort of, you know, leads to, I guess, farmers saying, well, why should I test? It's just a waste of time. You know? so, so no no result could be because the cow's own immune system has already dealt to that pathogen. Yes, and that well, happens quite a lot. That happens a lot with CNS and E. coli. Mm -hmm. And the way that sample's taken is very, very important to be hygienic. Very important, yeah. And I think, to be honest, if, if you can't take a clean sample and you're getting frustrated about that, what we need to remember is that if we're doing any intramammary treatments or teat sealing cows or dry cow therapy, we need to have the same level of hygiene. So if we're not able to take a clean milk sample, then we've really got to look at what are, what are, what are our processes because yeah. that's also going to lead to problems with, with treatments and things as well. I remember three years ago you gave us some help with a farmer in Southland that had a problem that was at his wit's end. He'd been farming for a long time. A guy at class is a very good farmer and he couldn't find anything. He, and it came back as yeast. Mm. <laughs> I remember that case. You remember that case. So... <laughs> Yeast, I'd never ever heard of it. Yeast in cows. Yeah, like the, yeah, it just shows you, like uh, in the beginning, people just used to say to us, um, you know, we just need to know if it's staph or strep. You need to know so much more than that because it helps you identify your problems. In that particular case, um, the poor guy was a low somatic cell count farmer, good farmer, um, was supplying a co-op that was new, um, rejected on his first eight batches of milk graded for uh, somatic cell count. And, and he was sort of questioning the new dairy company if they were, how were they testing the milk. Yeah. But when we looked, because his problem was subclinical once again, when we actually looked into it um, in the bulk tank, there was a lot of yeast. And, and it turned out from 12 cows through RMT testing that we found, eight of them had yeast. And that was something that he had actually pushed in during the dry cow administration. So like we talked about that, that sample preparation, the integrity of the sample, knowing how to clean teats before you're doing anything with them, whether it's teat seal dry cow antibiotic yeah. treatment or taking a sample for culture. Really important, important skill. So, so you know, we'll, we'll have farmers listening to this that are, you know, maybe battling, like we're seeing it now yeah. towards the end of the season, battling with a high cell count. You know, how, what's the first step you do to actually try and rectify that? Even if they're testing clinical cases of mastitis, that's yeah. going to give you a guide. Yes. But how would you address that? <laughs> I, th I think what we need to remember is there's two things. There are a lot of pathogens that don't actually give clinical symptoms, or very seldom. Staph aureus and CNS are good examples of that. Um, strep dyscalactase is a good example of that. So if we tend to look for clinicals, if we're always looking for the worst offenders, we're going to find bugs like E. coli, bugs like strep uberus, and bugs like um, E. coli and strep uberus, really the main ones you're probably going to find. Um, you're probably not going to see much of anything else. Yeah. So if we get that clinical picture, it is a little bit like an iceberg that we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg all the time and we're never addressing what's happening below the surface of the water, which in the case of an iceberg, it is really like mastitis, that 90% of that mass is under the water. And that's 
what's lying in the bulk tank with our subclinical cows that we're not even looking at. And often that's where the key, it's all pieces of a puzzle, and I'm not saying it's a panacea, but looking in the bulk tank um, with a test like our snapshot, you're actually getting a pathogen profile of what's happening, and then we can know from where those pathogens come from what the actions are, what the tweaks need to be made to the system so that we don't get so many clinical cases. If we work with the big part of the iceberg, we get fewer cases of clinical mastitis, but we also importantly address what's happening subclinically, which can be a feeder or underlying cause into those clinical cases. Yeah, so just looking at the clinical cases can give you a guideline, but is not necessarily exactly what's happening. It's, it's in not the whole head. picture. It's yeah. not the whole picture. So a lot of the, a lot of the time it's not going to be, I'll give you one example. Um, in Southland, we were dealing with a farm earlier this year. They were having a lot of E. coli mastitis. So they were testing. A lot of E. coli mastitis, never had this problem before. Where is it coming from? And what we realised, when we looked in their bulk tank, they had a lot of teat end damage. Yeah. Now, how's that linked to E. coli? Well, it's not really, except when you consider, because the teat ends were so damaged, that they're, um, they, they had, a, um, I guess, an indoor system where the cows were um, confined for part of the year anyway. Um, you know, the, the dirt and the manure was just sticking to the teats more than it would have been if they weren't like that. So while you're looking at E. coli, that might be useful to say, well, we treat or we don't treat or whatever. That, but the cow's still sick, so it doesn't really help you. Once prevent. We're, it doesn't help you prevent. Prevent, yeah. So prevention is, is really where we're very, very focused. Looking at what can we do to fix up this teat end damage will lead to a reduction in all of our clinical mastitis cases because that's the underlying cause. And yep. it's often not clinical, so it's something that we don't always see when we go culturing a few cows, you know. So you tell me this snapshot is a forensic overview of the bulk milk. By, by taking that test, you can really identify what those underlying issues are and then take <laughs> corrective actions. That's where your focus needs to be. Definitely. Um, I, I think most farmers know um, <laughs> it's not like, you know, you don't want to, it's not, it's not about let's take cows out of the vat so that we can be compliant. I yeah. think a lot of the time, um, you know, coming from a regulatory point of view with a, you know, a dairy company, they want you to sell milk of a certain quality. So there's a lot of focus on compliance. There's also a lot of focus on treatment because that's an animal, wel animal welfare issue. So if we've got cows that, that are sick and need treatment, I don't think any farmer would, you know, want to withhold that either, you know, so that everyone wants to do the right thing. But improvement is different. If we yeah. want to improve and we want to reduce the number of cases that we get and not be in that position in the first place, the name of the game for the farmer is to have all of his cows contributing to the bulk tank so he can sell his milk, not to manage different herds and mark cows up and have them grazing separately and draft it out. And, you know, at the end of milking, it's demoralising to see another herd that you have to milk. And for some farmers, that's a reality. We're talking about a herd, not yep. one or two cows. There might be 30. I was just talking to someone this morning that had 30 out. Now, that is kind of depressing. Look, I know you've you've just done some testing on a couple of herds in uh, in the Waikato. Two herds in particular. One of them had twenty eight percent of the herd with staff, and one one was thirty. Thirty. So that that's a hell of an issue to deal with, and that's quite demoralising, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it takes a lot of guesswork away, though. So even even though people are in a bad situation, or even though they know things aren't right, I think there's it's it's essential to seek help because it's not. Yeah. I think often people get led up the up the path of well, we're going to you know give it our all. Coming to the end of the season, we'll blanket dry cow and we'll do this and we'll do that. And next season it'll be better, and they hope it's going to be. Like you you don't want to guess. Like it, by by measuring, we actually have evidence to show what's going on. We're not guessing anymore. So instead of doing this sort of trial and error, um, and it's an expensive experiment at the farmer's expense. You know, like if yeah. we're just trying things to see if they work. Um, first of all, it creates a lot of stress because, um, you know, maybe it's not working. Uh, but second of all, there's a lot of action. So if we if we go and change everything all at once and we've got, you know, staff stripping the herd every milking, um, which is really common when people... That's not good if you've got staph aureus. <laughs> if you're stripping cows with staph aureus every milking or a quarter of milking, which I know some people do... They do, yeah. That, that's going to transfer. It's, it's Absolutely. So knowing what you're dealing with, I think, is a huge step forward in managing your problem um, and, and finding a solution. And for some people, those changes, you know, management of their mastitis might be very simple and, yeah. and they're very small tweaks. And for some people, it's going to be bigger, but at least they know what, they get, what they're dealing with. And so 
in the case of having 27%, 30% staph aureus, people listening might be thinking that's that's enormous, but it's actually more common than you think. And it's not insurmountable. So I just want to say to anyone who's having a, a challenge, like don't be afraid of finding out what's going on because that's how, you, how you're going to improve. Natasha, look, it's been it's been really great having this conversation today, and I, I hope it's been informative for people out there. I think I think one of the big things is there there is steps and measures we can take with with testing, obviously, from what you're telling us, and it's not a stigma to have mastitis either. It's very common, yeah. very very common. You've just come back from the National Mastitis Conference. Sorry, you were attended it online <laughs> this year, but you've attended the National <laughs> Mastitis Conference and. The US, I think, the last four or five years. You know what? What was the figure in the US of treatments? That's really interesting. I've been watching the US um, as we've gone along because their somatic cell count at the beginning, when we first started, um, their limit's seven hundred thousand. So everyone listening is going to go. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. But they um, they were sort of in the sort of high two hundreds when we started. Now their cell count's actually the same as New Zealand's average. So they are a hundred and around one hundred seventy thousand. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting because most systems in the states are confined; they're housed, so cows are literally lying in their own own manure, like constantly. And if you think they can do that well, what's well, interesting though, their treatment rate is thirty percent of cows during a lactation will be treated. One in three cows treated. One in three cows, which is huge. So you can say they're using a lot of antibiotics, and that's what I thought until we started looking at how much, you know, how many yep. cases farmers treated here, and I think. If people actually look at how many cases they get over a lactation, some people might be surprised how many cows they're treating. Because don't just look at the cows treated, it's how many treatments within a herd and extrapolate that as a percentage of the herd. Correct. And I know I've seen herds with 30 to 40% treated in New Zealand. Yeah. That's a hell of a cost. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge cost. Um, it's also a tax on the people working there. Like yeah. Nobody feels good about having these problems. And it's a lot of management and a lot of extra work for people. So I think once we realised that, you know, it's not just about knowing the pathogen for treating the, the, the case, it's actually knowing how to improve. And, 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 and finally, as we wrap this up, somatic cell count is a guide to animal health, but we, we still see herds being treated with high levels with a cell count of even 100,000. Yeah. Why? <laughs> I think sometimes people are trigger happy. I always say it's like having yep. a small child in the night with a fever. Like by giving it something, maybe you feel better. But yep. I think the, you know the key to success is knowing what that is. Like what was that? What was that you, that you just treated? Is it something that's going to take an insidious hold in your herd over time? Is it something that could have gone away by itself without treatment? Is it something that needed treating? Is it something that you she's going to bounce back in ten days' time back in front of you again? I think those things are good to know up front. Yeah. Cool. Look, Natasha, thank you very much for You're coming welcome. in and speaking to us. It's It's been a great chat, and I, I hope people out there have gained a glimmer of knowledge. I, I know my knowledge has improved out of sight working with you in the last three or four years. So, look, thanks very much for today. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks, guys.